Good morning, campers. Welcome to Radio Camp Half Blood, a Percy Jackson read along podcast. I am your host, Zach. And I'm B. And this week, we read chapter 10. We've made it to our 10th episode. Woo! Woo! 10 whole friggin' episodes. Can you believe it? And we have hundreds more to go. How long have we been doing this podcast? Like, how many months? About three. Three? Yeah, like three. I keep talking about how it's like, I just started. I'm like, oh, this is like a very new podcast. I'm like, oh, it's been three months already. How did that happen? Time flies when you're having fun, B. It's true. Also, time goes incredibly slowly when you read a book excruciatingly week at a time. I complain about this every week, but it, it, it doesn't get any weirder. Or any less weird, rather. We're going to be reading chapter 10 for this week. I ruin a perfectly good bus. Yeah. Perfectly good bus. What did you think of this chapter? It's a good chapter. Um, I feel like I say this every <laughs> chapter. I mean, I, I think it was more critical in the beginning because it's like, I don't know, maybe I'm impatient or something. And I, I like when things just cut to the chase and, and get to the action. And now, like, we really are in the proper swing of things, I guess. Like, this is the rising action, I guess you could you could call it, of the book. Like... It's kind of weird because it's like the big. It's always has been a rising action ever since the first chapter. Like we haven't even reached like normalcy yet. Yeah, that's true. But it's it's like getting into the swing of things in terms of like, okay, this quest will determine a lot of what the book is going to be about. I gather, like this is the main focus of what our characters will be doing i'm sure that there'll be like sort of distractions and weird things that stop them from completing the quest or like well not stop them completely but you know what i mean like sort of derail them in in different ways well they have 10 days how do you fill those 10 days worth of questing yeah exactly so there's probably you know some some weird sidetrack things and there's going to be like other monsters and yes because if you look at like i'm going to use the example of like road trip movies You know, it's like, you have to get to Shell City in 10 days. How do you fill those 10 days? Because, you know, it has to be in that structure. Yeah, it's just like a comedy of errors kind of thing. Obviously, it's not, you know, like trains, planes, and automobiles where it's just like everything's going wrong, but it's more like hero's journey type stuff. But it's it's like a similar I, I could consider this book to be more like planes, trains, and automobiles to an extent. Except the problem with planes, trains, and automobiles is if they were patient, they would have gotten on the plane because the weather blew over. That's true. That's a lesson in patience. Also, it's a lesson in the fact that John Candy is the greatest. <laughs> oh, I miss you, John Candy. I'm going to blow a kiss up to heaven for him. He was so great. He was such a sweet man. I love all of his movies so much. He was in the middle of making a movie, actually, when he passed away. Another one of his vacation kind of themed movies. But yeah, no, I there's great things I forgot about this chapter that, you know, it starts to kick off and how we have, I, I would call it the humble beginnings of this of the story where you have, you know, Percy gets a sword and you get, you know, a little more history about the beginning of time itself contrast between annabeth and percy and grover and you also get some action at the end which kind of builds up into you know what's going to be happening because we get to the point where we can't actually predict what's going to happen each chapter there are some you know little gripes that you can have about this and how it's just like get to the action and there you go but i think it's important especially with these books uh to kind of like ease your way into the exposition and the action especially here I'm like super biased when it comes to this kind of stuff because I don't actually find action all that compelling usually unless it's like paired with a lot of more world building, like living within the space kind of details, I guess. I I enjoy feeling like I'm I'm immersed in, in something. I think that's probably why... When I watch a movie, usually if I, I not like it, if it feels like it moves too quickly or like I didn't get to like sort of exist in the space that the whole movie was created to to have me experience, I guess. And that's what I like about this book, I think, I, especially because we're reading it so incrementally over time that it's I, I feel like I'm getting to know these characters slowly. I feel like I'm gradually getting acclimated to this world of Percy Jackson and like how things work in this universe. And it, it feels the it's the journey, not the destination kind of thing. And I, and I like that aspect of it. Oh, yeah, no, most definitely. Like I remember as a kid, like when I first read The Fellowship of the Ring. And I mean, expedition can be great, but... There's sometimes where it can be stra- straight out boring. Yeah. If you look at the Council of Elrod, uh, where he's explaining the entire history of the ring, it's only like 20 pages, but it took me like three days to read. Because it's a lot of minutiae. It's yeah. just boring. Like, in my opinion, like, there's, 
you can have fun exposition. So this chapter opens up with them getting ready for their quest. They're going to be going to Los Angeles. Do 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 do. Ocean, ocean's garbled vomit on a shore. <laughs> yeah, they're headed to Hades, and they're starting to gear up. So Creon gives them like a fat wad of a hundred dollars. Yeah, a whole hundred dollars. I'm probably more than that, but you know. I this think is... they say a hundred exactly, don't they? Yeah, one hundred dollars in mortal money, and then some extra weird, like immortal money, I guess. And they also got twenty golden drachmas, and talk about like solid gold coins. Yeah, yeah, because like the the pantheon of gods are so incredibly extra <laughs> that they refuse to accept anything but one hundred percent gold coins, as if a god would even have any use for gold. I mean, it looks pretty, and also a lot of their shrines are made out of gold. I always find that kind of strange to, like, associate a god with, like, caring about, like, a, a material thing like that that they couldn't ever possibly have a use for, like... Well, I mean, it has to do with, like, what we consider the finest things in life. Like, I would imagine they all wear silk, and they only eat pepper with their foods and pineapple. No, like, I, I obviously understand that it's, like, the the a sign of the times of when those mythic beings were first thought up as like, oh, what is, what represents something sort of like high and mighty and important and, you know, not of the everyday. So I, I understand like the sort of relation to that. It's just kind of funny. But I kind of like how it's like in this to kind of incorporate because drachmas were made out of silver in Greek times. It's like how we're going to incorporate these old Greek things, but like we're going to make it relevant to the gods. So you have them pure gold. Yeah, it's like, oh, we're even better than silver. We have we have gold. And then there's, like, gods above them that have, like, platinum. <laughs> and then the gods above them have, like, the sort of, like, the, the you know, the black credit card that only billionaires have. I like how this is funny because you were telling me they're the size of Girl Scout cookies. And I'm just thinking, B, didn't you just get Girl Scout cookies? I just got an entire enormous cardboard box filled with Girl Scout cookies, like, to the point where it was a little bit embarrassing to be carrying it from my car. I think at a certain point, when you live in a two-person household and you're carrying a box filled with, like, eight boxes of cookies, you have to, like, re-examine your life choices just a little bit. But I think I've examined my life choices and I'm pretty happy with the fact that I have a bunch of Tagalongs and Samoas and Thin Mints and what's... Did I, are those the only ones? Oh, we also got s'mores. That's the only. So yeah. Crayon also gives them a big bag of ambrosia and like a really, really big, I won't say like double gulp, triple gulp. What's the biggest gulp you can get at 7-Eleven now filled with nectar? I don't think I've ever been to a 7-Eleven in my life. What? Yeah. I mean, we just have other corner stores here. So like 7-Eleven isn't that ubiquitous. Like there's just other bodegas and stuff that you go to. I, I've seen 7-Elevens. I just, I don't know if I've gone in. So for me, like, if you can't get, like, a cup of soda that, like, is bigger than, like, a small child. A small child. I was just meant to say, like, that Parks and Rec bit. Is that a Parks and Rec bit where they're just like, this is child size? Yes, it's the size of a one-year-old child. <laughs> I think so. I think that that's right. Yeah. Or it's child size. I like size. the way they describe ambrosia as, like, being in squares. I feel like I, I picture it in my mind's eye as, like, lemon squares. And that sounds delicious. I think of it like, yes, it kind of reminds me of, in my brain, like, Lembras bread. Yeah. I've always wanted to try like, that. Only, you only need to take a small nibble of it and you'll feel hung, full for days. <laughs> and then they eat a bunch of it. Yeah. I that I relate deeply to the Hobbit ethos, um, for sure. I am a Hobbit at heart. Yeah. I mean, I'm also Hobbit-sized. I got Hobbit feet, so I'm good. Yeah. I've, also, when my hair grows out, I, I have quite the Frodo vibe. But yeah, that's essentially what ambrosia is. Other than the the important distinction that we have to make clear is that if they eat too much of the ambrosia or drink too much of the nectar, they will get sick and they will literally burn up and die because they are demigods and it is food made for gods. I, I get that too, but then I just take some Tums. Actually, you know what? I ordered Thai food last night and I ordered the soup that I thought would be normal and then I drank it, and it was like drinking lava. It, like, tasted fine. It was, like, good. It was very spicy. But, but like, my stomach... It, have you ever seen those videos where they take a red-hot nickel ball and they just, like, drop it 
like onto a thing of ice and it just burns through the ice that's what the, that was like the soup in my stomach it was just burning a hole just straight <laughs> into my stomach it was the worst experience it yeah so yeah that's that was kind of like if i were to drink nectar that's what would happen perhaps it was nectar that's what i was drinking oh my god b you're you're a demigod oh because i didn't die you mean <laughs> Yeah, you didn't die. I just have a very terrible stomach ache this morning. And then the last thing is that good old Annabeth packs her Yankees baseball cap of invisibility. And I had forgot about this that in, I'm sure it's in the myth, but I was rewatching Clash of the Titans, the Ray Harryhausen version, not the really awful remake. <laughs> the, the very important mythological reference of Clash of the Titans. Yes. The Perseus actually has a helm of invisibility. So it's like kind of canon or whatever. It's kind of canon, yeah. But they give it to Annabeth, and she has this Yankee cap that her mom, Athena, goddess of wisdom and war strategy, gave to her. And it's really funny that it's a Yankees cap. It's it's like very viscerally hilarious to me that it's a Yankees cap because I've just seen so many people wearing Yankees caps in my life. I myself had a Yankees cap when I was a kid, despite the fact that my interest in baseball went as far as baseball is a thing. My dad says I should like it. Okay, my dad will throw this ball at me and I will then freak out and drop my wiffle bat and be very upset. But I, I did have a hat, regardless of the fact that I wasn't really invested in the concept of baseball. So did it turn you invisible? If anything, I think it had the power to turn invisible on its own, because it went missing in a playground when I was a child for a couple hours, and then I, I found it in the sand again. Well, the most 90s memory, actually, whilst I was at a screening of the movie, I think it was the first Air Bud that they were projecting on on a screen at this park. And we were drinking like those weird juices out of those plastic barrels. Oh, you! Oh, no, you're talking like the red yes. ones and blue ones. Like. Yeah, like it's basically Kool Aid. So we're drinking the weird Kool Aid out of the plastic barrels that have like a weird peel off top. For some reason, it doesn't have a straw or something. It's a very weird mechanism for juice delivery. And I lost my Yankee cap, and that's like a very visceral childhood memory that really <laughs> feels so incredibly '90s when I talk about it. It's like I might as well have had like you know. I can just imagine in the background, I just hear smells like Teen Spirit. That's like vaguely like wafting through the air. I, I should have been like eating Dunkaroos. Like Tony Hawk was there. He just skated by like. And then you turn around your dad's now vanilla ice. You just reminded me of like a very involved story about the time that my dad Rick rolled me in person in the sense that he dressed up as Rick Astley. <laughs> Go on. Okay. I know that this sounds like a lie. I know that this doesn't sound real, but I swear, I swear on my life that this truly happened. My dad thought it was hilarious that the Never Gonna Give You Up song became a meme because he remembered from the 80s when it was in fact just a song on the radio that people thought was a song that was good, I guess. And the weird plot twist, of course, that it it's a, a very deep voice that sounds like Isaac Hayes-esque and then you see who's singing it and it's Rick Astley who, who resembles like Conan O'Brien or something. And... My dad was like, okay, play it on YouTube. I, I can't believe that this is a joke that people keep doing. This. He, th he, he Googled it. He saw a news article about Rick Rowling, and he thought it was hilarious. So he's like, play it for me. And I was like, I don't really want to do that. And then he's like, play it for me. And then he like wouldn't sit down and come watch it with us. And I should have suspected him then, but I was naive. I was a naive child. And so then finally he's like, no, just play it. I'll be in in a second. And so I just played it. And out of nowhere... His hair is combed up like Rick Astley, and he's wearing a raincoat, like a trench coat, like he, like Rick Astley is in the video. And I've never seen this coat before in my life or since. And he just starts dancing and like doing like the whole spiel, the dance and the lip syncing. And he rickrolled me in person. And then I went to run. This was before I even had a camera phone. This was before like smartphones or anything i ran to go get my digital camera that i got for christmas and before i could turn it on he was gone and he turned to me and my sister and said no one will ever believe you and went upstairs i think all of our friends and all of our listeners have just tuned out from laughing too much <laughs> grover gets his fake feet again because you know he needs to go out into the wild yeah well because that would be kind of awkward if he um was a satyr while walking around, looking all goat person-like. 
He just says that it's his goat for leggings. Yeah. I mean, now, because there's, like, a bunch of cosplayers now that do that. Like, they actually have, like, hoofed leggings. That's true. Like, the thing is, is, like, in New York City... If I saw someone with goat legs, I'd be like, cool costume. Like, it, I would not bat an eye. I would just be like, okay, well, that's that's a normal thing that happens every day here. Gosh darn anime kids with their weefoos. Yeah, I mean, like, I've been in New York City during Comic-Con and just, like, the very bizarre sight of seeing just a bunch of cosplaying people from all sorts of fandoms that I don't even recognize just like streaming out of the subway it's a very surreal experience so I really do think that you would kind of blend in anyway I I just think it would be funny like Grover would definitely blend in in New York City but like as he would cross the country and get more towards the Midwest I just know that immediately people would be like what is wrong with that kid yeah I mean then again they talk about the mist in this chapter like wouldn't people just perceive that he had legs like, that's, that's kind of like a weird plot hole thing. If most people can't interpret monsters, why can't he just, like, walk around and be like, oh, don't worry about it? Is it because he's, like, a satyr that he's kind of, like, this weird mix of person and not, so it's like they can't cover certain things? Because I don't know how the mist works. Well, maybe, the, but then again, it's like later on in the chapter we get Mrs. Dodds and the Furies turning into, like, grotesque monsters, and people are like, oh, what's going on here? Yeah, I guess, but they're not people at all, though. They're, like actual monsters but like you know what i mean because it is consistent with like chiron and stuff like his he has to hide his legs from percy maybe it's because other demigods they can spot it right away if someone has like an answer for this we'd love to hear this like if you look at camp half blood like it looks like a regular strawberry farm we actually got a message from someone on tumblr telling us this yeah yeah you you talked about that yeah, I, I'd be interested to know, like, how that, the mechanics of that. I mean, they do talk about it more in length later on, but it's just, like, a base idea of what Mist is. And, you know, my favorite part of this chapter is the very timely references that you kind of forget about when this book is, like, written. Like, th- those are very relevant to, d- to today, and I had to, like, stop and actually listen to the song to take me back to 2005. So, along the way, Grover accompanies them with his magical flute because he can play songs he only knows two songs one is mozart's piano concerto number 12 and the other one's a very modern and very relevant song it won't be outdated at all and i was surprised they didn't hillary duff hillary duff's <laughs> so yesterday so yesterday so yesterday. i was like i forgot that oh, hillary God. duff like wrote music like there was that weird period of time where like oh i had her cd i'm pretty sure I'm almost certain I had her CD. Well, my sister was obsessed with Hilary Duff, so I remember seeing the Lizzie McGuire movie like a thousand times on VHS. Oh, I saw the Lizzie McGuire movie in theaters with my dad and my sister, and my dad was the only guy in the whole theater, and it was very uncomfortable. And we were all like, and whether they'd get together, and um, and my dad was like, who are these children? <laughs> But, I mean, it is it is what it is. And I just think it's really funny, like, they haven't updated these references. Like, I know in Goosebumps books, uh, they actually revise them to so make the timely references more timely. I feel like that's, like, kind of a real pain for an editor. editor. Like, can you imagine, like, all right, uh, okay, what's, like, the current equivalent of Hillary Duff? I don't know. Um, the one with the face. Is Do the kids like the Kesha? Like, I could just picture <laughs> I'm just trying to brainstorm. Like, I just, like, I mean, Rick Riordan was a middle school teacher, and, like, he had kids of his own, so this was probably, like, really easy. He just had a thing about Yeah, what... everyone was probably just really into it at the time. It's really interesting when you see, like, these timely references, but it takes you back, but, like, a kid now would be like, who's that? Yeah. I mean, they might know who Hillary Duff is. She doesn't really, she's not involved in, like, show business really much at all. Oh, yeah, because she's a mom. Now. Like, she's married and settled down and all that kind of stuff. You know what? As far as kid stars go, good for her. She really out of all of them, she's the she turned out the best. Yeah, she she got veneers. She got married. She's like smiling on the cover of magazines, living her life, has a baby or something, maybe a couple babies. Listen, I don't have her Wikipedia page in front of me, but you know what? <laughs> More power to her. Honestly, I think Hilary Duff is a pretty good reference because she ended up being a nice person still. Like, she's a normal person. Like, if they had referenced someone like, Miley like Cyrus? Lindsay Lohan or whatever, who like, yeah, someone who, like, really went off the deep end and said some, you know, cuckoo banana stuff on the internet or whatever, or, like, did some sort of offensive, you know, racist thing, then that would be a whole other complicated layer to this reference. Oh, so Percy Jackson loves Mel Gibson movies? 
Yeah, exactly. Like, it's like one of those like weird things where like, especially like now within the age of like Me Too and like people sort of a lot of things surfacing from like celebrities that we used to really worship and talk about as if they were like super great. And now like every reference to them in pop culture like has like this weird twinge to it. So it's like, oh, yeah, I forgot about that. Ugh. In the game of craps of picking a, a, a Disney Channel original movie star or whatever, they did a pretty good job. Well, I mean, I guess it also makes sense because uh, these books are distributed by Disney, Disney Hyperion. Oh, that makes sense. So they... You know what? Actually, it totally makes sense that they would pick a Disney star. I didn't even think about that. So they've always been owned by Disney, right? So yeah, that like that totally tracks. So it would have to be like a Disney star that they were referencing if they were to change it. Yeah, I didn't even, that didn't even occur to me, actually. If this is a, a Disney universe kind of thing, and Hilary Duff exists, does that mean that there's a possibility that in the universe of Percy Jackson, the movie 13th Year exists? <gasps> As an actual DVD that Percy watches? <laughs> and he's like, oh my god, that's me! Bro, same, totally. Yes, water powers. I'm very thirsty all the time. He just like put. He, he like jumps into the water. Put me in the water fast. I'm changing quick. That's like my go-to like joke to make when I take a selfie at the beach, and only I find it funny. <laughs> Though we get some other gifts as well as we we get the magical shoes that Luke gives Grover. Actually, gives him to Percy, but Percy gives him to Gro- Grover. Yeah, not the best gift. I mean, he kind of takes in stride where he's like, thank you for your thoughts. But then it's like, he can't wear flying shoes because that's the whole reason they can't take a plane is that Zeus will see him flying and will murder him with a lightning bolt. So not the most thought out gift, but it's very thoughtful. Well, maybe not thoughtful because it didn't really have a lot of thought that went into it. It was very kind. Well, I mean, they need all the help they can get. Yeah, and and Grover could make use of it, even though Grover is kind of like an anxious ball of worry. Actually, I guess the best way to put it is it's like the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe when they meet Santa Claus, where they start get, where Santa arms them to the teeth with weapons. <laughs> I forgot about that. How weird! What a weird book series in general, really. Where it's like, you know what Santa is? An arms dealer, kids. Like what? What are you? Why? Why is he here? Is it Christmas? I I feel like it's not even Christmas when they see him. He's just like Santa in the woods. Well, if I remember correctly, this is going to sound really nerdy and going back to like authors loving each other. Santa was was representing J.R.R. Tolkien, whereas in Lord of the Rings, Treebeard was supposed to be C.S. Lewis. Yeah, speaking of literary man crushes, wow. C.S. Lewis modeled Santa after J.R.R. Tolkien, if I remember correctly in my... That's a weird Santa. J.R.R. Tolkien X C.S. Lewis fanfic. But I love it. It's like they all get all these gifts. And Percy's like, man, I wish I got something cool. And then that's when like Creon's like, oh, oh, I, I have something for you. I almost forgot. I- it's like, oh, wait. He just gives him a random Tide pen. Tide or Anaclomosmos. Anaclomosmos? Okay. This is me genuinely trying to pronounce it. Anaclomosmos. Right? We just said it in unison, like a weird call. Let me read it phonetically. Anna Koslosmos. It's definitely not that. You just kind of sound like you're speaking Simlish. Anna Klusmus, which translates to, oh no, the Grim Reaper has come, for I am trapped in a pool. No, it means Riptide. Oh yes, it does. It means Riptide. Percy gets the pen, which is Riptide, and we're going to only call it Riptide from now on, yes, so we're not fools. so we don't sound like idiots trying to mispronounce things, because I still don't even know if I'm saying Chiron's name right. I probably am not. Creon, Chiron, someone hasn't corrected us yet, I don't think. I think, it, well, the I becomes before the R, though, like, it, it, well, we, you and I have been saying it differently, so one of us is wrong, or perhaps both of us are wrong, or maybe we're both right, maybe there's no way or to know. Or you know what, we're just gonna call Creon Chuck from now on. So, Chuck the Pony Man, um, <laughs> gives him a sword <laughs> called Riptide. Which, I like that, because, you know, that tells you that the sword's gonna stay, because... If you look at any story that has to deal with mythology or like earthy Indian mythology, and that is if you have a sword that has a name, it has a history to it. And that means it's... Yeah, it somehow lingers throughout all of the, the turbulence of the story. If you look at Excalibur, you look at Sting, the sword, which actually I think is the only exception because Bilbo actually named a sword. Yeah, not quite the same. He finds like a dagger and gives it a name. <laughs> 
Well, yeah, he gives it a name when he was defeating the spiders in Mirkwood Forest. I mean, there's, there's there are exceptions, but, you know, we have the sword, which all swords that have names have troubled pasts. And we have Riptide, which is a good gift that he gets because it's a perfectly balanced sword. It's from Poseidon, right? Basically, yes. It's, like, passed down. Do they specify what that exactly means? Like, that he, like, he set it aside for him, basically? Or, like... Poseidon probably went to Creon and was like, I don't know, but I think um, I might be having a kid soon. Wink, wink. And in case you know who it is, here's a pen sword. Yeah, some people get their father's pocket watch or something. Very meaningful when they grow up. Some people get a sword with a fancy name. Well, this is the greatest sword ever because... The pen cannot be lost. Yeah, that that's like a really great feature, basically. Like, yeah, so he it it disappears whenever you drop your sword. It always like respawns basically back in his pocket as a pen, and then turns into a sword at his will. You know what I would do with that uncapping un- pocket sword? Yeah, I would probably do that too. In all honesty, <laughs> but it has to be like a Dale Gribble kind of vo- voice, where he's like pocket sword. Eh. Uh, that's why Percy also keeps pocket sand because you know he is son of Poseidon, so he has sand. All the time. Pocket sand. I wonder how many um, YA literature antagonists could have been defeated with pocket sand. Definitely Voldemort. I think that's really cool. And then we kind of get a history of something that I like about the series. And that is these swords are made of celestial bronze and cyclopeans. And they can only hurt monsters. If they hurt humans, they just go right through them. Oh, yeah. So, like, basically, like, the, the way that the sword functions in the way that it can only harm monsters, but it can't hur- harm people is like a funny twist on the fact that at like the actual Camp Half-Blood, the the camp that we just um, conducted an interview with out of Brooklyn, they like give their kids, campers, demigods, whatever, foam swords. And they literally are harmless to people because they're made out of foam, but they do kill monsters. So they have like the same function as Riptide. The problem with with demigods is they can be hurt by the swords as well as mortal weapons. Yeah, so they have double the vulnerabilities as well as double the strength in a way they're like this weird nebulous in between that's what i liked about this is like you have like this thing where it's like there's not real consequences to hurting mortals because you can't that's like a good thing to have in a kid's book honestly like i guess like it would add some added drama and i'm sure that there are some books for the same demographic that would go in that darker direction but it, it would be kind of like a weird messy thing to deal with like murdered casualties of random people who happened to be there when like a monster appeared so that's kind of a good detail to just have speaking generally when it comes to like kids literature and fantasy like with swords and bows and all this stuff because this is less about like modern technology because you know you could easily have like Ares cabin just have like rocket launchers and like machine guns and all this stuff but like you 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 set it back where it's almost again timeless where you have swords and like because you could i've read a lot of kids fantasy such as the ranger's apprentice aragon the hobbit and fantasy stories where it's like you everyone you get sword there's something i guess mythological when it comes to sword and stuff that's why i think the lightsaber is such a a huge thing in nerd culture because it's a literal laser sword yeah yeah it like it takes you back to a, a different time also it, like it sort of relates the the jedi back to like something like a like a knight or like a samurai or something where they have a code and all that kind of stuff it makes it like more rooted in like the lore of heroes journeys and oh stuff. yeah no most definitely because i'll give you a prime example of this and how like this could not work in percy jackson if you've watched Raiders of the Lost Ark when Indy is trying to fight the guy with the sword and he just shoots him, you don't have much of a story. He does, like, the whole fancy sword thing. And, like, it wasn't that improvised. Well, yeah, because Harrison Ford got food poisoned the day before. So he was, like, if you look at him, he's, like, deathly ill. And they were going to have this elaborate fight scene. He's like, can I just shoot him? And, like, oh, my God, that sounds amazing because that fits Indy's character. So, yeah, it's kind of like with here, too. It's like if Percy had, like, a gun, he could solve, like, 90% of his problems really quickly. I mean, that's, like most books this isn't right? sponsored by the nra in any mean shape or form yeah no like i definitely don't think that guns solve all problems but as far as like if you're physically fighting someone you know you don't bring a a knife to a gunfight kind of thing so well unless you're really good with a knife yeah unless you're like a literal ninja but of course yeah i mean you could say that about a lot of books where you could be like oh yeah it would have been so much easier if harry potter just like 
lifted his gun and shot Voldemort in the head, which someone did edit a gif to be that way, where instead of him lifting his wand, he just has a gun and shoots him in the stomach. <laughs> and it's so funny. Oh, it actually shoots him in the head and he just, like, falls over. I mean, this is incredibly violent, but it's it's funny because it's a, you know, a mythical evil wizard, so it's fine. It's, you know. <laughs> well, I mean, because it's like, that's the interesting thing about Harry Potter, is, like, people can be hurt like that with guns, they just don't they they even bring up guns in harry potter with serious black yeah, like they exist like it's not like they're impervious to it it's just in addition they have like these magic wands i like that about this is it's set more into like personal fighting yeah it, it also involves like a more specific kind of like training too, like the training montage idea of like learning sword fighting and stuff it's like a it's steeped in in mythic imagery you know you think of like that that scene in hercules where they're where he's training to use the sword and the go the distance is playing in the background, you know, that whole thing. Yes. As well as I think, again, this goes back to Rick Riordan making sure there's no plot holes is that why don't they use a cell phone? Because if they use cell phones, monsters would know where they are. Which, <laughs> which like. is kind of really very funny to imagine a monster like using a phone somehow to track a person being like, uh, like looking on Google maps or something or has some sort of like weird hacking device. Like are monsters like anonymous? Like, I don't <laughs> I wouldn't know how to track somebody. Well, I like that about that. You know, that you cover these these ground rules, and then finally they can go on their quest, which is, you know, they get Argus, who is a man with many eyes, eyeballed it. He's the head of security of Camp Half Blood. There's something very upsetting and about the description of him. He's just coated completely in eyeballs, just everywhere. So we can't be surprised. Yes, I understand the. The physical benefit of the eyeballs. I am still creeped out by them. Yeah, what if his eyes are all, like, really red? Or pocket sand? Is the number one enemy of Argus the Eyeball Man. Because he's just immediately just down for the count if you throw some pocket sand at that dude. Well, you only have, like, one shot of pocket sand, so he'll just turn around That's and fight true. you. Does he have, like, eyeballs, like all over his body like on his chest and stuff too like that feels like very uncomfortable like if you have a shirt over your eyeballs like do you know what i mean that just (laughs) he would have to walk around naked to to like have like a full you know use of all of his eyes or like wear weird transparent clothing i'm just trying to think of like the utilitarian use (laughs) oh he wears like the netted like knot shirts he just has like a weird mesh outfit on so he could peek through oh this is like a very upsetting image i i took an upsetting image that was already creeping me out and made it even worse well this is why you have me here (laughs) yeah there's a lot of body horror happening (laughs) in this book sometimes so he's gonna take them into new york because he can't really leave the camp and the one thing that i liked about this as well is that before they finally leave, Creon starts to explain to Percy kind of like the there's actually like ages of mythology, like the first they're on the fifth age, but there's only been like a true uh, four and five. So fourth was the Titans, and it was pretty much anarchy. Kronos is like I don't like humans, so we're just gonna make them for entertainment and cheap thrills. Yeah, basically. And kind of the gods warmed up. This goes back to like the gods being very fallible. Yeah, they they they're basically like people. They they have like powers, but they have like human emotions. Yeah, which I like about that because you know you have the one Titan Prometheus who gave them fire, and and even in his time he was considered a radical. Gave the humans fire, and then ever since then they've been advancing. Which is weird because if I remember correctly, please someone's gonna correct me if I'm wrong about this. I already know this. Is that the first time they made humans, they weren't quite right? (laughs) They were, like, all messed up. They were like, this is too many eyes. Six eyes, five arms. Argus was like, no, this is just the right amount of eyes. Just imagine him crying, too. Yeah, just, it's a very horrible thing to really think about. Like, it's really upsetting, but it's, like, almost like, so in these ages, I think the first time they made humans, it was, like, in The Matrix when Agent Smith was telling Neo, well, the first time we made The Matrix... We had no wars and nothing, and everyone went crazy because you had no problems. You kind of need, you know, conflict, like organized conflict. Yeah, exactly. So it's like, um, in a weird way, adding like a controlled amount of chaos into the world prevents chaos from bubbling up anyway from a perfect world or something is basically like the logic. Yes. Well, because if you have no problems, people will find problems. 
That's that's true. No matter what. So just by having like the, the right amount of problems, you can create a near perfect world. Because I don't think there, there's such a thing as a perfect world. Because there's always going to be a, a, some type of yeah, problem. Yeah, and also in the in this universe, obviously, there's like always monsters appearing continuously, and they cannot die. So it's kind of like this endless cycle. As well as. Emphasis on that was like the Titans are not truly dead. They're just locked away in terrible yeah, prisons. Which, you know, that's not foreshadowing anything. No. Well, it's in the text. Yeah. So they hop into Argus's car, the Argus Mobile, and uh, they drive all the way to New York and they, they go to B's favorite place in the whole world, the Greyhound bus station. I've never been on a Greyhound. I've been on other terrible buses, but from what I've I've heard, everything is bad about Greyhound. When my... When my friend did have that horrible experience with the Greyhound bus, I was looking through the Greyhound tag, and there's just like this one tweet <laughs> where this guy was like, F you, Greyhound bus. And I swear, their like helpline Twitter was just like, why would you say that? <laughs> like, really earnestly, and it's like, you know what you did, Greyhound. <laughs> you know what you did. I think really Rick Ryden is warning people about the Greyhound buses. This is more of a morality tale about not getting on a Greyhound bus. That is warning people about the dangers of buses. Rick Riordan, what bus hurt you as a kid? Like, statistically, probably one of them. I mean, you go on a bus every day when you're a child, so there's bound to have something traumatic happen on a bus. Statistically, what happened? I need a Rick Riordan, if you ever come on the show, we're going to ask you, what, what, what was your deal with buses? Because there have already been two, and we're only on Chapter 10 that, that have been completely demolished. A call to our listeners. Have you ever had a good experience on a bus? Like, you took a trip, round trip, and everything was fine the whole time. Has that ever happened in the history of ever? I feel like the innate nature of buses is that they go wrong. I don't know what it is. They have a chaotic energy. And I guess you could also bring up that time is at the essence here, and they only have 10 days. And I guess... We kind of did the research. It would take about two days, more like three days, to get from New York to California by bus, apparently. Which I don't understand how that's a thing, but... I guess it, it's like two days straight with no stops. Feasible, though. That's not a thing that you can do. Like, you have to wait in between at, like, depots and stuff. And it's... God, just talking about this is giving me anxiety. I'm just really glad I'm not on a bus right now. Well, I mean, it's like, isn't it funny how... Like, Percy's dad is the god of water. Why doesn't he get on a boat and sail to Panama? There's definitely waterways in America. There's, like, rivers and lakes, and I feel like... Well, the mighty Mississippi won't get you yeah, there. The, if you the went Mississippi's from... north and south, but there must be, like, some vague east-west... Percy hops on a boat, sails all the way past Florida, goes through Panama... Well, actually, that might take much more long time. Unless he has water powers, and then it doesn't matter. Or does He's he like a work speedboat. like Frozone, where he can like just use the water in the air? <laughs> we can just like water ski above the water, uh, above like the road. Do 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 do. That'd be kind of cool. But then he would get to like the desert states or whatever, and then it would all dry up, and then he'd die. Yeah, he'd be like a fish, like just like left out to bake in the sun. Right before they get onto the bus, Percy realizes that they're like, minutes away from his mom and Gabe's awful apartment building. So Grover can feel people's emotions and he can feel that Percy's talk about his crummy stepdad. His crummy, disgusting, smelly stepdad. And like, yeah, most likely their entire place is just covered in filth and grime. And like he opened it up and it's like the worst episode of Hoarders. This is where we get the biggest bombshell and why Sally Jackson is put up with Gabe Uliano. Do you want to explain why she has stayed with this man through thick or thin till death do us part? Be fully transparent here and say I think it's a dumb reason. And that reason is that because Gabe is so smelly that the monsters can't smell Percy. I feel like that there's a more one-to-one -one solution to Percy not being murdered by monsters other than marrying a man who innately smells strong enough to repel mythical creatures or at least confuse them enough that they can't smell magic. Because that's like, that doesn't make sense to me. I feel like you could 
move next to a dump, like start work at a perfume factory. Like I, I feel like there's a thousand things you could do to distract monsters from smelling your child other than marrying a terrible abusive man who happens to emit such a powerful supernatural stink that monsters are like confused or like i think the way they described it in the book is like he's so smells such like a human so he's quintessentially the most basic human being alive that just move to california live in a starbucks I just, like, I don't get it. Like, I feel like there are definitely sweaty people who are nicer. Like, I've, speaking of buses, I've been in public transportation. I know that people are disgusting. There are definitely smelly people who are also not bad people in their hearts. No, they just forget to shower because they're busy. Yeah, like, there are people out there. I mean, okay, this is, like, another problem that children's literature tends to have a little bit, where they equate, like, certain, like, aesthetic superficial things to like morality so like if a character is unclean if a character is fat if like certain things like that are related to being evil even though that those aren't necessarily like morality judgment things well i mean it's it's like making judgment calls very quickly like you can describe this character and automatically to a kid oh that's like an evil or mean person even though they could be like the sweetest old man in the world they just happen to be somewhat bald smell a little bit and fat because they like beer a lot. I keep thinking of like Mike. You know who I start thinking of now when I think of Gabe Bugliano? Who? Uh, Carl from Aqua Team Hunger Force. Oh, yeah. You know what? That's a really good head cannon. I could really. I could get behind that. I think Danny DeVito, but specifically in the Matilda movie, just because it's a very similar kind of character of like a very neglectful dad who's kind of a bit of a scummy, like, shyster. Who, but he's not as, like, I guess. Well, I mean, okay, the pro- okay so. I think I think Danny DeVito's character is a much better human being compared to Gabe. Yeah, he's just like a little bit of a huckster, but he's not like he just wants to make money. Whereas Gabe swindles kids out of their lunch yes, money, yeah. literally. Well, Matilda's dad swindles adults out of money. He puts sawdust in their oil and <laughs> puts their car in reverse. <laughs> yeah, he's not a good guy. I don't know. I think my problem with this is that, I, like you said, there's much more different solutions. I mean, I think it is really, really, really stupid to have this reason, especially when, like, Gabe is in abuse fill. Like, are you helping the kid more by keeping him protected this way or just honestly just telling him? Exactly. Yeah. What What are the trade-offs here? Like, he, you're surrounding him by abuse anyway, so... You're not even protecting him, really, just because this guy is smelly. Like, it's just, it's like a very, it's kind of a dumb plot point, honestly. It doesn't really explain a lot. I mean, there, and there's, like, no way you, if someone could, like, defend this, you can't. Like, you cannot defend, like. It's not morally justifiable. Like, I like Sally Jackson as a character later on in the books, but, like, here you pretty much say she's like, oh, it, this is our best intentions. But no, not really, because Gabe's gotten abuse fill. A couple of times. Either this plot point is dumb or his mom is a bad mom. Like, those are the only possibilities at this point. Because, like, the inside, like, the internal justification and, like, logic doesn't add up. So it must be, like, Sally just, like, not understanding that that's, like, not a good trade-off. Like, it just doesn't, it doesn't make sense. Well, I mean, I think, okay, if I'm going to try to play devil's advocate on this which I don't really want to, but I feel like this question could be answered, is that she'd rather have her... She'd rather have, like, her step-husband uh, kind of be vaguely abusive and stuff than put her son in a life of heroes, wizards, and all those wonderful things that, you know, could really help a child. Because I guess the option is either she's just afraid of losing Percy because if she gives him to Camp half which is a vaguely like a cult, she may or may not ever see him again, and that's like her only connection to happiness. Yeah, that's another difficult thing. So she just she doesn't want to give him to safety because she knows she'll never see him again, basically. Yes, it's kind of like putting Moses down the river. But it's also like, I'm not even blaming her for wanting to stay with Percy and like all of that. I'm just blaming her for her 
approach to it and like her weird justification for being with an abusive person like that's like not a very important thing it's not like he has some sort of like really magical rare thing about him do you know what i'm saying he's just smelly like that's not a rare trait in a person i feel like the book thinks it's a little bit clever for making this a plot point but i think it just introduces a whole lot of weird judgment questions about his mom well i mean like i said look again me trying to play devil's advocate i think these might be the reasons which you know Rick Riordan was trying to attend to do, but for us, we're looking at it as, you know, Sally Jackson may be a superficial person, but it's really hard to say right now, but I can just, I can just say that as without spoiling the book, I feel like th- there's more to the story than, the, than, than, than you think, except there, I guess that's kind of the position of a character arc. Yeah. Maybe her justifications have become clearer later on. I just don't have the full picture right now, but from what, from the information I do have, she doesn't seem to make the best choices in the name of Percy, even though she thinks she's protecting him. Well, okay, you gotta remember it this way, is that she lost her parents at a very young age. She had to deal with a kind of a crummy uncle who died of cancer and left her nothing. And then she got, like, knocked up at 18. Had Actually, like, less than that. I think she left high school. It's like, you have these situations where if you, if you come from abuse, you're more than likely to, you know be drawn more towards people with that. Yeah, because, like, that's, like, your norm, so you don't understand how unhealthy it is or something. Yeah. Sally Jackson's uncle was a lot like Gabe, and that's just... There's, like, a lot of, like, what-ifs and whatnot. Like, we're... Like, like the best way to put it is we're trying to tackle this uh, with an atom bomb, then we are looking at this as just a... Like, a literal sentence. <laughs> yeah, literal sentence. I know, I know what you mean. It's just, it's, like, it's a very strange detail because it's, like, trying to establish the internal logic of why things exist in the world and it just seems weird. But, yeah, I get what you mean. It Like, it's not as important as we might be making it out to be. It is a very important topic to have because it's such a superficial idea. It's just to most kids, they would just... I would call it, like... Sen- sentence stuffing like you st- stuff sentences like that into there just to be kind of funny and kids will forget about it there's all sorts of genres of books that are guilty of this where everything that is set up has a reason to exist like gabe doesn't he can just be smelly like that could just be a trait about him but like for it to be like a thing that works into the general like lore of the story is like not only unnecessary but like makes it more complicated and weird it's kind of like how my, my perfect example of of this would be like in in something like signs where everything is like not a coincidence it all adds up i mean I'm, i don't care about spoiling signs because it's not a good movie but um <laughs> basically like the whole idea of it is basically like oh all these like little details that you think aren't a big deal are actually a big deal like oh the aliens are you know their weakness is water so this girl who leaves water around all over the place that's why it like it benefits them to have all this water all over the place because that's what their weakness is even though it's dumb that aliens would come to a planet that's covered in water when there's a a million other planets that aren't but aside from that it's like the same kind of thing where it's like oh ho ho i'm very clever you thought that that was a very unimportant detail but it's actually a very important detail to the lore and i'm very very smart for thinking of it it's like actually you're not smart because like if you think about it for more than two seconds it's kind of ridiculous but but there's like i'll give you an example of like a great idea that has the payoff i'm gonna look at die hard and how the beginning of the movie is you know john mcclain doesn't like planes and the guy gives him the advice about the feet thing yeah the feet thing it's like oh, our main hero is not going to be wearing shoes the entire time. And then as it's going on, like, you get, like, little details such as, like, oh, here's a hard-boiled cop. He might not be smart, but he's, you know, he's very clever. You build it up and build it up to the point of where, you know, the cops don't believe him, so he has to do these, like, ludicrous things, like, throw dead bodies off of the roof. I mean, I think, yeah, it works in that because it's, like, it has, like, a, a, a consistency or something. Like, it's not always... It's not always smart to take something from before that seemed insignificant and then connect it back to a larger thing. That Sometimes that doesn't work. Sometimes it's like a, a book like this is going to trend towards moments like this where they try to connect a minor detail that exists in like the mortal or normal world to something more magic realism like i get why those kinds of things exist because they're trying to like make a cohesive universe in which like there aren't as many coincidences as there are like reasons why things work and how like the sort of the two worlds interact in a different way and that would have been cool if it was like a better reason i guess we've been talking about this for a long time but i do think it kind of represents a we don't thing. okay so basically more of the story of this one of this literal sentence is it's a really st- it's a stupid, stupid, reason. It's stupid silly. thing that 
It's a stupid reason to have, and there's like re- the like we're trying to explore it from every angle possible, and there's no right angle to this. And I listeners, if you want to tell us your opinions on this, we'd love to hear it. Yeah, maybe you're you're defensive of of this explanation, but I I really think it's silly. Um, Please refrain from using uh, s- spoilers. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If you're messaging me, tr- try not to. The message message uh, radio camp at gmail dot com. I read the emails first before I can give them to B. He screens them, so I'm I'm not spoiled. I'm kept in the dark. Yes, and we try really hard not to do that, and that's what I kind of like about. We've got messages about you know you not reading the books, and you know even though for you sometimes it can be frustrating that we're reading a chapter at the time, it actually helps this podcast because you know we can look at these different angles. Yeah, because I don't. I'm going in completely as the blind. Which, you know, we would have probably, if it was just you and me being very fanatical and pretty much this podcast being like a fan cast instead of like a deconstruction of a kid's book, we could have just skimmed right over that and like, eh, it's fine because we know what happens later on in the mm-hmm. series. Or yeah, you're not so as invested so. also. So like you're, we're looking at it from different places. Yeah. it's le- We have less of a bias when it comes to this stuff. And, you know, that's what you have to do when you look at these books in more of a critical sense is we have to, we have to try to ignore our our biases Mm -hmm. i'm also yeah i'm not like particularly invested in the percy jackson series i I don't have anything against it or anything but it's like i don't have any nostalgia built into it so i can kind of look at it and go does that make sense is that a clever thing that they did or is that just ridiculous no it's one of the things that i've i've always remembered from the series because as a kid even i thought it was a little stupid but it's just because I thought it was a stupid thing, but now as we talk about it, it sounds worse. <laughs> I feel like Rick Rodin, of all the episodes he'll ever listen to of this podcast, for some reason he'll find us <laughs> saying this one mean thing. Well, I mean, I'm pretty sure like he's grown as an author, so maybe... Not this... to say that this chapter is even bad or whatever, it's just like a really one-off thing, and we've been talking about it for a long time, but it's just it's like a, it's a pet peeve that I have that I... Yeah. Which, Rick Riordan, if you want to come on our show and... Just ex- defend yourself. Not, no, no, don't defend yourself, because I feel like if you would... It's not even like defending yourself. Don't defend your life here. Uh, we like our cherry pies, but not like... I give you nine pies. One for every day that you're here. <laughs> if anyone gets that joke, you win a prize. <laughs> Yeah, seriously. If you could, if you could message us what that movie is, I would be really impressed. Because I, the only other person who I've met who has seen that movie is Zach. I'd love if Rick Riordan came on and kind of, ex- you know, if we had like small little concerns like this, I'd like to talk. Like that's kind of like a thing I'd like to talk about authors about. Like, what were your mindset? Even though most likely he just needed to fill out words on a page, and this is the smartest thing he could do. Yeah, that's that's another thing too. Like, I, I I'm of two minds, literally, in the sense that. I have like this literature brain of like, oh, I'm analyzing this and picking this to death and like close reading. Like that was like a really big thing when I was learning like literature sort of approaches to things is like you have to like break this down literally by each sentence. Like what is the word choice? Why do they pick this word as opposed to a synonym of that word? Like that kind of like minutia dismantling. And then the like flip side of that is me being a literature major who has to then write like 10 page papers 20 page papers 60 page thesis whatever like that kind of stuff and then sometimes you just use a word and it's just because you say a thing and sometimes you say you like make some sort of internal consistency that well I mean, it also could just be that rick Ryden, while he was writing this he just thought it would be funny to have gabe the only reason why he's st- sally has stayed with this man is because he's smelly yeah, I mean, it is kind of played for laughs, too. Like, it's a, it's like a joke. So it's it's not taking itself too seriously. <laughs> like like I said before, we're, like sometimes if we go on these diatribes, it's us analyzing a word sentence with an atomic bomb rather than looking at it at face value. It It is also said tongue-in-cheek. We're like, just trying to, like, demolish it. <laughs> that, that's another thing, too. It's like, this is a children's book. So a lot of times, sometimes a, a detail is in there literally because it's kind of funny. It's like, it has, like, this weird, you know, irony to it where it's like, ah, oh, isn't that hilarious that all along the, the fact that he was smelly was a benefit? Like, that's like, okay, you're just being, you're just making a joke there. Even though, like, it would be funnier if he was, like, less crummy. That's the problem, though. Like, if he was just kind of like this, like, schlubby guy that did nothing... Like, if he was just, like, the Homer Simpson-esque, like, he'd rather just sit down and drink beer all day instead of beating his wife, it, it would be a funnier joke, but it's not. It's not a funny joke. It's 
Yeah. It's not. Mm-hmm. A... That's true too. Because. But I yeah, guess yeah, we, yeah. I think we should move on now for the yeah, sake of. Sorry, my we're really harping cause... on this. I just yeah, we have opinions. We do have opinions. So they get on the bus, and they sit down, and they start. They're about to leave when all of a sudden three old ladies come in, and one of them looks vaguely familiar, like old lady esque. But what do they look like? They look like um, Mrs. Dobbs. Old Lady Dodds. Yeah, she's. When I was young, they used to call me Young Lady Dodds. They start moving in, and the, the bus starts going, and they go into the creepiest place ever, the Lincoln Tunnel, a place that I've been in and I've wanted to like just run out of because you're underwater in the small little tunnel, and there's always yeah, traffic. Yeah, it's, it's very oppressively creepy. I think I've only been in the Lincoln t- Tunnel a couple of times, honestly. I try to avoid it at all costs. But I, it just makes me think of that Buddy the Elf line where he's like talking about it. He's like, and then I walked through the forest of swirly, twirly gumdrops. And then I walked through the Lincoln Tunnel. While they're in the Lincoln Tunnel, all three ladies are like, I need to go to the bathroom. It's almost like, so they all say it like unisense. And I just imagine, again, I know, like I just think maybe because I have series of unfortunate events in my brain, but I'm thinking of like the two powered face women. That would be like my fan cast already. Oh, yeah. Actually, that's what I was thinking too, because it says that two of them look exactly the same. So, I mean, like elderly women who look the same, that's my go to reference is the white face women in the Netflix series. And the, uh, they'd be totally be down to do this. Yeah, they totally would. I mean, they were in Wicker Man. They would. <laughs> they would. They've worked with Nick Cage. They can work with Logan Learman again. Yeah. Yeah, Logan Lerman as Percy, he is now 27, and he has 5 o'clock shadow. Hey guys, I'm Percy, just regular boy. I'm Child. Percy Jackson, a young 12-year-old boy who definitely sounds like a normal 12-year-old boy. And it's like, look at my friend Grover over here, and it's Morgan Freeman. Like, not de-aged at all. <laughs> You either get busy being a satyr, or you get busy dying, or something. (laughs) And Annabeth has the clever idea of using the invisible cap, which is a very Harry Potter thing, because Harry Potter has a cloak of invisibility. It's the same thing. Again, this is, again, another parallel, but it's... Functionally the same. It is, but also it's not, because I guess it's pre-established in mythology. Well, yeah. So, in a way, J.K. Rowling ripped off mythology... Well, she did because they're they're in the first book. They have Cerberus, which is fluffy. Yeah, that's true. There's a lot of overlap. Centaurs, and then they have dragons. Yeah, she just she like kind of mined all kinds of mythology and sort of magic. Her major in college was classics. That makes a lot of sense. I would be really interested to see her have a conversation with Rick Rord and how like their approach to classics and incorporating it in children's books, like what they would say. So they get up, Percy puts on the cap and goes completely invisible. Luckily, he doesn't have to take off his clothes. Yeah, that would be weird. And he, like, moves through the aisle as the three old ladies kind of get to his seat. And he goes to the front of the bus where they're driving. And all of a sudden, he just hears them scream and Percy turns around and they've all turned into horrific monsters. And Percy has the smartest idea. And by smart, I mean stupidest idea in the world. Stupidest idea, which is let's crash the bus and murder people forever and, and he's like I, the way i put it is what i think of like the vine instead of jesus take the wheel it's poseidon take the wheel like he grabs the wheel and jerks it to the side i'm doing a jerking motion and <laughs> so thank you, you for it. describing that because we can't see well if you close your eyes you can see me doing it I can picture you pantomiming as percy grabbing the wheel and tugging on it. And, like, the bus, For like, swerves. For some reason, my mind is pr- producing the song Shut Up and Drive by Rihanna. I don't know. This is what my brain does. The bus starts to skidding, like, crashes into some cars. And they're so- they get out of the Lincoln Tunnel, so now they're in New Jersey. That's where the Furies start to attack again. But this time, Percy does the second stupidest thing of all day. And he pulls the emergency brake, and the car, like, the bus literally swerves. Yeah, they Tokyo just... Drift, which is, yeah, t- right? Like, that's how you Tokyo Drift, right? You just hit the emergency brake? That's kind of... And then they, no, they skid because it's kind of, because it's Jersey, so it's always raining and miserable. So everyone gets out of the bus, out of the pool, and all of a sudden they, they feel, like, lightning, because, you know, the arm hair pricks up, and they realize that all their bags are still in the good old bus, when all of a sudden, Boom! And lightning hits the bus, which is convenient at the time because, you know, the bus explodes right before it explodes, though. Hey, thanks, Zeus. You did some murdering for us. Didn't have to get our hands dirty. A 
Taurus takes a picture of Percy as they run yeah. off. Nothing bad could happen here. Yeah, that definitely won't lead to him being wanted or perceived as a, like, criminal on the lamb at all. So then Percy, Annabeth, and Grover run into the good old woods of New Jersey. <laughs> you know, the safe, lovable woods of New Jersey, home to Bigfoot and the Jersey Devil. I really hope there's a Jersey Devil appearance. I don't think there will be, because that's not mythology, but can you imagine? The Jersey Devil's, like, so disgusting. It's not even scary. It's just like, oh, yeah, that sure is a big rat. That's a real big, kind of vaguely amphibious-looking rat. I don't know. So, the chapter ends with them running into the perfectly safe woods of New Jersey. And the chapter kind of ends. What did you think of this chapter, B? I kind of touched on this in the beginning, but basically, um, I like just, like, the little touches of uh, action that we get in this. Like, we, I really feel a sense of, like, the stakes rising. Like, um, the monsters feel like more of a prescient threat. Like, they're they're waiting for Percy and that they're kind of pursuing him actively as soon as he steps out of the confines of Camp Half-Blood, he's immediately sort of endangered and he doesn't really have anything to conceal his location, like a smelly stepdad, for instance. Yeah, I, I, I really like this chapter all in all. I mean, I, I we really did have a big gripe about the whole weird, like, smelly Gabe thing, but like, as much as I talked about that, it's like not that big of a plot point compared to all the other stuff that happens in this chapter. I really like just, like, more of the world-building stuff that Chiron talks about, like, the sort of, like, the different ages of the gods and, like, what how things were like before and how civilization has since changed. I think it was, like, a good establishment of, like, different lore and things without being too over the top. It was, like, this, this chapter was, like, a, a balance of some things that we've already experienced. It's, like, a little bit of the monster fighting that we've already seen, a little bit of, like, learning about um, the sort of world that we live in. We have some character development of, like, Percy and, and Annabeth and uh, Grover all kind of interacting with, with each other as, like, this weird trio going on this quest. There's, like, a lot of stuff going on, and I think it does a good job of, like, balancing all of those things in a way that's, like, fun. It, it's hard to strike that balance sometimes, because I, I do think that sometimes action can get be, can get a little bit rote to just sort of hear constantly, like, and then he moved his sword this way, or whatever, or, like, and then he grabbed the bus, and it's, I, I think, I, I find myself getting a little bit bored in fight scenes and stuff and i think the use of of percy overtaking the bus and using that as like a way of defeating the furies is like a clever way of making it not just like another battle that's similar to him fighting the minotaur or something it could be super easy they could obviously like rick riding could just write so they fight like he, he gets into it just enough to make it like really interesting but like the way that they fight is really cool it's not just like a sword fight or something. The one thing that I like about Percy Jackson is there's very little times where it's like Percy will pull out a sword and mm -hmm. defeat an enemy this way. Yeah, I mean, like, it, the sword is involved, but it's like... It's a tool. It's, not, it's a tool. There's, like, other stuff going on, and, like, the way that he uses the bus is, like, a tool also to, like, distract and to, like, save the passengers and all this, like, other complicated stuff like that. That makes the fight scene, like, more fun for me. I'm, like, I'm weirdly not impressed or interested in... A lot of action scenes a lot of times I, I find descriptions of them is kind of boring sometimes so i think okay so if we want to talk about that i feel like when it comes to writing action because i've gone to writing seminars where it has been like people that study martial arts explaining like how how you do a fist fight in words and that's not fun i feel like when you're talking about like action like that it has to be a visual thing like that's the way it works in movies because you can see this all happening in your brain you can think of like there's um I'm going to give an example of, in the name of the wind, in the very beginning of the book, there's a part where Coat, uh, he, like, takes out these spiders, and for the longest time, everyone thought that he d had done Kung Fu, so Patrick Rothfuss is like, I'm just going to write it that he knows Kung Fu now, later on. Like, he actually learns, like, a martial arts very similar to Kung Fu, as a joke. So, like, you can write martial arts and stuff poorly, to the point of where it's, like, a contrived mess, where you can just, like, skim through it, to the point of, you know... Doesn't work. That's what I like about Percy Jackson as well as like they kind of incorporate, you know, how, how the creatures and stuff are defeated through their own myths. I feel like excited to see what happens next. I'm very intrigued as to what the um the picture that the the Taurus snap is is going to do to their 
quest and like how they're perceived by mortals whether that's going to be like a real like daily punctilio like his face in the newspaper again or something like if it's going to be some sort of situation like that I, I think there was like a really good amount of like f- just enough foreshadowing without it feeling like it was like such an unsatisfying cliffhanger that I was annoyed all in all I'm like really happy with most of this chapter except for the weird Gabe detail that I just thought was so profoundly silly but like usually before we we record we talk about some of the stuff we're gonna talk about but very briefly and we didn't even bring that up yeah it's just something that happens yeah i mean i i had known that i found it really silly but the more i thought about it like just the the use of that specific like writing mechanism i think i i generally just have an aversion to but like that's not to say that the rest of the the rest of the chapter isn't good because it, it, for the most part, like it does its job pretty well. Like, especially when they start arming up and they start talking more about like the different ages, almost like again, in Lord of the Rings and the Hobbit, how there's, there's always different ages of things as well as, you know, Percy gets his sword as well as, you know, there's, I think there's some great things about this as well as, you know, we did talk about the grapes, uh, like things that I like about like stuff like this is just, it's just like a lot less explaining instead of like Percy's like, look at the sword. It's named Riptide. Why is it named that? Well, let me explain the incomplete and utter history of the sword to you, Percy, before you leave. Yeah, it's just enough exposition to make it interesting. Like, I know people that like are like total gun nuts or sword nuts and they'll go when they write his sword nuts. I, yeah. I studied the blade. Well, you know, okay, what I'm about to say is like they will, when they write like fantasy... They will, like, describe the sword in great lengthy detail. Yeah, because they think that's, like, really fun for people. And I do not find that kind of writing. It's just a sword. Yeah. And I like that about this. And you pretty much know it's a bronze sword. And people, that's the great thing about it is, is it's vague enough that people can make their own fan arts and stuff about it. And also it's on the cover of the book. The, the version I have anyway. Oh, actually the other ones too. But, yeah. Yeah, you, it's it's vaguely on the cover of my book. It's it's not super prominent. It's just kind of dragging in the water. And I think that's what's great about this is like Rick Ryden does he does a fine job of giving description but not enough where it becomes utterly boring. Yeah. So we actually got a bunch of reviews for this week, so we're super excited for that. Bunch of reviews. Yes, so thanks guys for sending in iTunes reviews. We love it. We appreciate it and we love reading them on air. And every time you send it to us, it helps us with our numbers. And that means more people can listen to us, and that means we can just... The, the amount of response that we've gotten for the show has been, like, so amazing, and we've gotten so much love. We just want to... If we could, like, personally thank each and every one of you for listening, we could. And I'd love to shake your guys' hands. We have an Iris message from Elaine. I hope you guys get this Iris message. I also sent one in a message from the coast of Miami. Maybe it'll reach B. Fingers crossed. B, th- did you receive a message in a bottle? I mean, I haven't been on a coast. I mean, like, I, I'm i technically on a coast in the sense that I live in New York, but I'm not, like, going to the water at a reasonable, like, amount of time. Like, I, that's not something I do where I just go and look at the Atlantic Ocean. Like, I'd have to go and drive and find it. Um, I'm closer to the Hudson if it, if it somehow made its way up the Hudson River, then maybe I'd find it. Yeah, that's really weird because, like, I just walked outside because apparently everyone in California lives on the beach. Yes. And there was actually a message in the bottle. So you want me to open it up right now? Yeah, open the bottle. (laughs) Okay, so there's the bottle. Ooh. Wait, let me get... I'm getting the paper. Okay, so... So the message actually is from Elaine. Wow! I just got to House of Hades, the fourth book from the second series. I just discovered this podcast and I loved your funny commentary. I also thought quicksand and being lost at sea would be a much bigger problem in society. Your analysis points out a lot of things I never noticed. My first read through. I love it. I'm 25 and I also grew up with these books and it's so interesting hearing an analysis from a different perspective. Please don't stop. You make my morning drive to work so much more bearable. Heart emoji. Such a great review. That's really nice. I really like how she mentioned the thing about um being lost at sea in quicksand. I do think that is a real old standby for an anxious child is to be afraid of quicksand and being lost at sea. Most notably because of things like Artax and the Swamp of Sadness, as featured in the Never Ending Story, and uh, Pippi Longstocking and the fact that her 
family was lost at sea for an indeterminate amount of time. So also in Pete's Magic Dragon, I'm pretty sure there's also a, a lost at sea element there. Just people were always getting lost at sea. Why like wh- why are people always getting lost at sea? What does that mean? It's like a weird nebulous in between state of being dead and alive. It's like you know, sort of Schrodinger's the character where they're out there somewhere. Maybe they'll return. Maybe they're dead. I don't know. It's it's a stressful thought to have as an eight year old. Um, or being like in the Goonies and trying to find One Eyed Willie's treasure. Yeah, like the weird pirate associations with that too. It's just it's a it's a it's a creepy concept. The way I put it with that, it's like you're more like in limbo because you don't really know for sure because there's no body, so there's no end. Yeah, exactly. It's creepy. It's a creepy concept. Because death is not always a final. So we have another one. A fun look at Percy Jackson from Mom of Book Nerds. So, you know, this is like makes me happy. We got like a seal of approval from a mom. Yeah, this is like, it's really funny because I've been podcasting about like children's books for a while and i think this is the first time i've ever gotten a review from a mom before unless i'm like mistaken but like as far as like noticeably seeing that someone definitely is like a mom listening with their kids like that's like a really cool thing i think that's that's like a demographic of people i never even considered were listening like i would love to have like parents that actually have kids that are reading the series now for the first time or have read it to come on the show and kind of talk about it what it's like as an adult like that have kids cuz um, i can safely say me and me are not really in the point of our lives right now where we want to have children yeah i yeah <laughs> So it's like, it would be interesting to hear from a different perspective like that and what it's like to read these books with like children or kids or young adults. Yeah. I mean, all you just read to your dog, which is nice in its own way. Yes. But my dog doesn't respond to me. So she could be like looking at like a piece of chicken and like that's, that's her attention. And I'm just reading because I like reading. Mm-hmm. Yeah. She's like, bork, bork. Your dog is very cute. <laughs> I feel like you should just post your dog more on the twitter in general i i'm a proud dog parent so i just send pictures to be all the time of my dog look at my dog doing this yeah just random of just her looking like making a weird face yeah i should send more hedgehog pictures i just don't pick him up that much because he is prickly this is a fun look at percy jackson books the hosts are fun to listen to and bring in stories and references from other sources i love the approach of one person not knowing the ending it makes for to add some humor worth a listen to thank you mom of book nerds yeah that's really nice i'm i'm glad that we're making content that like families can enjoy i do know that it it is sometimes hard to um to censor your thoughts (laughs) to make sure that like this this content can be like consumable for kids as young as like nine or ten or something all the way up to you know grown adults who love this series um it can really you know, run the gamut, people who care about young adult literature. It's really, as much as it's it's so heavily marketed towards a specific audience, really young adult literature is so widely consumed by all sorts of people. So we actually got one more, and I really like this one. So it's from Pidge from Voltron. Now I know what a Pidge is, so this made less sense now because I didn't really, I didn't know what, I know what Voltron is, but I didn't know who Pidge was. And I have, a, I went to a birthday party yesterday and someone dressed up as Pidge. So it makes more sense now. I like listening to this whilst painting and on long car journeys. It's the first podcast series I've listened to, and Percy Jackson is such a great series to start. I like to chat other stuff as well, and it keeps the episodes from being too similar. I like how key slash interesting sentences are quoted and given context to this dust. Overall, great. I'm st- it's like such a great honor to have someone. This is our first podcast. Yeah, to, like, to be first. like a first podcast. Like that's like I can't even imagine starting to listen to podcasts because of something that i am doing this thing with you talking about books for me it's always just kind of been that's the dream of getting some this is their first podcast because you know the first podcast can always make or break what people perceive of this medium yeah definitely and i do think that um a lot a lot of people don't listen to podcasts like it's one of those things where you mention that you have a podcast and people are like how do you listen to that? What do I what do I have to do? Do I have do I can I put it on my phone? What how does that work? Are you on the does YouTube? Does it work in my microwave? Like, yeah, people like uh, especially I've experienced definitely with older people, but like people in general like it's not like a medium that's universal. Everyone has a TV, everyone watches movies, they 
read books, but to listen to a podcast is like, feel like this extra commitment. You have to like sell people on the medium too. You have to be like, hey, no, really, listening to this thing is fun. You'll enjoy it. And, you know, it, I feel, I feel like it's really cool and nice that someone actually took a chance on the whole concept on this podcast of all podcasts. Well, yeah, no, most definitely, especially like when it comes to podcasting, it's really interesting because most people do have iPhones and they, it's like it's a mandatory app now so everyone has access to podcasts as well no, as well as it being on spotify and all these like we put ours on youtube and stuff so we get a bunch of like these huge fields of people that have never listened to podcasts before and i think that's a great honor to have especially like for me as a growing up it's kind of weird because i've always wanted to do a podcast and it just took a long long time yeah my my road to podcasting was a a very weird one. <laughs> but well, how about this, B? What, what was your very first podcast you ever listened to? What kind of got you into this mindset of podcasting? I think technically it would have to be Throwing Shade, which is a podcast from the Maximum Fun Network. Though I only really listened to one episode. It wasn't like exactly my sense of humor. It's like very like kind of pop culture, like almost gossipy kind of style of humor whatever it it's a good enough podcast no shade or anything <laughs> uh no pun intended either but um it they happen to have like an interstitial like ad for the other maximum fun podcast oh no ross and carrie which is like really when i latched on to the idea like why i downloaded the app onto my phone why i fell down that kind of rabbit hole and like of course maximum fun is like the network that I mainly consume podcasts from. I mean, of course, I consume podcasts from kind of all over the place. It's, you know, like, you know, HeadGum or something like that. Or what's the other one? Feral Audio has since become defunct, I'm pretty sure. But there's like a whole... Oh, it's like Nightville Radio. Or Night yeah, Nightville Radio. Like all sorts of ones. But um, I think definitely Maximum Fun Network in general was like my sort of entryway into podcasts. Um, I, I listened. I like binged owner Ross and Carrie one summer I was renovating my room at the time so I would just I remember like painting things and like you know sanding things and making all sorts of like shelving (laughs) units and stuff for my room while listening to like the entire backlog of that podcast and then it totally like launched me into like this obsession that has since led me to co-host two shows with people who started off as total strangers and have since become my friends so it's it's such a weird, crazy thing that could have easily not happened. Yeah, no, for me, it's it's very similar to that. But for me, growing up, I used to play, like, when I mean, like, an ungodly amount of video games, I mean, like, an ungodly amount of video games, like, a lot. So I used to get really obsessed with, I had, like, manias, where I used to play way back. So this had to have been at least good 2008, 2009. Uh, I used to be really obsessed with Team Fortress 2. I was, like, looking for more stuff, like, people talking about it, and I ended up finding my first podcast, which was Control Point, a now-defunct TF2 podcast. And it's, like, really weird because it was, like, the first one where I would, like, listen to the episodes constantly, and then I would re-listen to them. And it was, like, this weird, like, a bunch of, like, these, like, southern dads, like, talking about these games and <laughs> talking about... It's kind of what got me... Dads. Into, no, they are, they're, all from, they're all from Alabama, or a bunch of them were in Alabama at the time. They had all these other podcasts. This was the Dead Workers Party. And, and now they're defunct. But it's, like, really weird. And, like, I kind of, like, latched on to this idea that, oh, you can make content about anything and stuff. And I like that about that. Especially, like, with podcasting. Like, as me as a kid, I used to grow While I was growing up, it was a lot of the time both my parents were working and my sister was doing her own thing. So it was, like, I had, like, these little friends like, I'd listen to in the background. I definitely do think that podcasting in general has, like, the the reputation of, like, feeling like you're having a conversation with a friend who you're close with. So I, th- I do think that, that that aspect of the medium is really nice. I, I just, I really can't get over that. That's, it's really cool that, that someone's first podcast is, is this one of all things. Especially because we're so, we're such a new show, really. I mean, you and I have other shows that we have done for a little while, but, like, we've only really been doing Radio Camp Half-Blood for, like, three months now, and already we've gotten such an overwhelmingly nice amount of feedback from so many different people, like, being really honestly generous to me, who is going in completely blind and doesn't really have a lot to say as far as what actually happens in these books. But, um, yeah, I've, I've just been blown away by that. The one thing that I love that I've I like looking at is when I see our numbers is I don't really look at our numbers. I look at 
uh, how many countries and places we've touched and we've touched a lot to the point of where I can actually tell like my grandfather, look, we've like, we're in like all these wonderful places like England, France, Israel, and even China and even South Korea. We might have a listener on Twitter who's um, from Thailand. Yeah. Actually, we have two listeners from Thailand. Yeah. And it's just, like, that's so crazy. Like, I've never been to Thailand. I, I've, I can't even picture when I would go to Thailand. And then there's someone there in Thailand of all places, like listening to me talk about this book series like that's like the internet is so crazy that that's a thing and that's such like a great thing as well as with the internet is just how you can connect to so many people it's like you know like we said before it's like a podcast is like having a hundred friends and you know we consider you everyone here listening our friends and that's kind of like the the one thing that we love about this thanks so thanks guys i, I guess this is like a nice thing of saying we've gotten to 10 episodes yeah it's like our big 10 episode like wow we really are hit, getting into the swing of things 10 whole episodes it's crazy oh we haven't even hit the ground running yet i mean there's, there's a lot to come for sure oh we got plenty we got so many wonderful things we have a wonderful interview that either either is out now or not out and in, in that case and you're confused about what we're talking about and you're confused what we're talking about except if it's already you know what we're talking about then you're a time traveler if it isn't out already so i'm, uh, I'm sure it, it within within the range of when this episode is out but but yeah our our interview with um with the real camp half-blood so to speak um in new york was like really empowering. awesome and i'm, and I'm <laughs> yeah it was really great i'm i'm looking forward to that episode and i want to see everyone's um reactions to it because i i really had a great time yeah no we just wanted to thank everyone and we have so much more to come and we're so, so excited because we're very very ah. excited so thanks guys b where can they find you uh, you can find me on Tumblr at twinpoetry.tumblr.com and you can find me on twitter at b kelly gorman if you want to find me on Twitter, you can find me on Twitter at Suda41. That's S-U-D-A-4-1. If you want to if you want to tweet at our show, you can tweet at us at Halfblood underscore radio, and we post updates, we post silly pictures, and we post kind of what we talk about. If you want to follow our show and email us and send us messages, even reviews, because we accept reviews on emails as well as iris messages. If you want to ask us anything specifically, we'll answer on air. You can email us at radio camp halfblood at gmail.com well I, th- I think that's that's the episode yeah i think that's the episode i think we we did it i'm zach i'm b and keep staying mortal goodbye Bye.